So hi, um, I'm Han. I, um, have, for everyone here, I hope you are here for the Casper demonstration slash talk. Um, like I said earlier, if you just walked in, if you guys are very familiar with the Casper suite, you guys, this may not be the right session. If there was something that looked interesting to you, you may want to check it out because this will be somewhat fundamental. Um, for those who have never seen it, I think this would be a good opportunity. So um, let's begin. So the five W's, right? What are they, right? They're who, what, where, when, why, right? We all learned this when we were like six years old in elementary school. And the reasons we were taught these you know, five very cool W words, and I know there's how, but you know, who cares about how, um, is because they're really good ways to figure out how to know something or how to like, get to know more about a topic or anything. You know, I want to know who made this microphone or who made these chocolates and where they're from and what are they and when were they made and all that good stuff. So to kind of introduce that, these are the five W is of me, right? So I am, I'm gonna say adult beverages because I don't wanna say beer geek or like, because I like beer and I like wine and I like bourbon and all that really good stuff. Um, more importantly for you guys, I professionally work with Max. Uh, I've been doing it since like 01 or so. Um, first time I ever owned a Mac was like in the 90s, was this really cool PowerBook 520. Was it a PowerBook? Was it called a PowerBook back then? I don't remember, all right. <laughs> um, I am a uh, certified Casper administrator. This is a certification that Jamf actually offers for those who just want to take this exam. It's a three-day um, thing that they go inside and out of the Casper suite. Um, where? I live in the greater Boston area. And any other questions about me? I'm kind of just a silly me, so. So why am I, why am I giving this talk? Um, so I do not work for Jamf. I um, started using it actually not that long ago. I'm going to say about a year. I've, you know, so I'm sort of like that advanced beginner. I'm not really like the super expert Jamf guy like the guys that are out there that actually work for the company are. But there was a lot of things when I started working with it that I really wish I knew beforehand. Um, I came from an area where I was working with tools like Monkey and tools like Deploy Studio. And I started working with the Jamf suite and I go, it doesn't work the same way that I thought it would work with using these other tools. So I kind of had to relearn my logic on some level. And um, should have done this earlier. I'm sorry about that. Ah, why isn't there on water? <laughs> there we go. Never mind. I apologize for that. How many IT people does it take to open a water bottle? So. So I want to share some of those ideas and some of those like, things that I wish I just really knew. This is not going to be talking about the Casper 9 suite, which is coming out whenever it's coming out. It was announced last Thanksgiving-ish at uh, the Jamf National User Conference last year. Um, the current version is 8.7. So we will not be discussing version 9. The little bit I have worked with version 9, it is completely <laughs> different inside and out. But you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the concepts still apply. You know, like I said, the UI is completely different. So what you see on the screen will look very different in the near future. But for now, the concepts still hold. And I said, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so the, my answer to that is it, it depends on your situation. And like I said, version 9 is different, but the fundamental ideas behind what we're, I'm going to show today still hold. Um, so that's still TBA, I think, so to be announced or to be determined. So you may want to talk to the guys outside. It's a good idea. Um, again, like I said, I have no idea when version 9 is coming out. So go over a little bit about the history. And so who is Jamf, right? So two guys named Chip and Zach, back in 2001 or so, they said, um, and this is all just 
things that I've gathered from other people I've talked to at Jamf and other things that I've read, they've just kind of went back. This is early days of OS 10. This is like maybe 10, two days. And there was really nothing out there to allow people to uh, get a hold of like Mac management, especially, you know, who bought Macs back in the 10, two days outside of education, right? So they were like, you know, we need to come up with something. Um, we saw this great need. So two guys, you know, now I guess in the last 10 years, you know, that's $20 million of revenue. They're a huge company, huge meaning they have, you know, 3,000 organizations around the world using this piece of software. So they're out of Minneapolis. Um, they have offices in, in Cupertino, New York, Hong Kong, and Eau Claire, Wisconsin of all weird places. But I guess that's where they're from or one of them's from there. So um, Eau Claire is actually where all the development and all the uh, support happens. So most of the guys you'll probably interact with are probably from that office. Like I said, it's used by companies all around the world. And this is always the, uh, the funny question. So you know, what does it stand for? You know, is it an acronym, right? The one I heard the first time I started using the software was, <laughs> and it's a line from a Clint Eastwood movie, I guess, in the 70s. That's what people always say it is. The official answer that I got was from Chip that it's this character from this weird book that no one's ever heard of. I'll come up with it, All right? I heard just another Mac fanboy, just another management framework. It's a recursive, it's Jamf, it's Apple management framework. So no one really knows what it stands for. I like the first one personally. I always think it's always the first one. So, so let's actually go into a little bit, you know, fun and games. So what is this real Casper suite and what is the idea behind it, right? So it's the Jamf software solution originally for OS X machines. That's exactly what they were trying to do from the very beginning. It's expanded now into both OS X and iOS, but the focus is still Apple. So they are always gonna be focused on the Apple platform. Jamf isn't gonna release a PC client to manage PCs. They're not gonna make an Android MDM solution. They are exclusively focused on Apple-based products and only Apple-based products. So what's in this thing they call the Casper suite, right? So it has a, a bunch of pieces, a bunch of moving pieces. They all kind of fit together in some weird way. So at the, at the uh, center of it is this thing called the Jamf software server. They call it JSS for short. It's the, um, it's the center of where everything else in the suite kind of connects to. Uh, part of that is the Casper admin app. They give you an app called Composer to make packages. Um, Casper Imaging, it's kind of self-explanatory, it's their imaging product. Casper Remote is their remote software slash remote support slash screen sharing slash other things that you want to do remotely, but just a one-off thing, not necessarily, you know, what you want to do all the time. And lastly, there's this thing called Recon. Recon is Casper's way of talking to, getting a computer, your client, to talk back to your JSS. So let's look a little bit deeper into this thing called JSS, right? So it's a web app, plain and simple. Um, it runs Tomcat. It runs, you know, that's the front end, MySQL in the back end. You know, um, officially supports OS 10, Linux, and Windows. That means you can install this software on OS 10 servers. They give you a simple PKG that you just double click, you run it through, it's really simple. Uh, the Linux one is pretty simple as well. I haven't seen the Windows one, but I imagine it's pretty easy as well. Um, in terms of your server requirements or firewall, the things you really need to make sure that are open is, you know, obviously HTTP, uh, AFP for file sharing, Samba if you want to use it, um, SSH. SSH is really important in Casper. It's kind of the way everything communicates back and forth. So, so let's talk about um, JSS. If you guys have any questions, by the way, feel free to just slow down and ask. Is AFP required? It is not required. Um, it's, it, so in the situations that I've used it where shops did not want to use AFP for, for a variety of reasons, you can use Samba. Um, you can even use HTTP to download things. 
Um, AFP just seems to work better in a lot of cases because it's the Mac native file sharing platform, so, but not necessary. So things that JSS does, just in your center, when you first log in, um, it'll let you look at your inventory of how many Macs you have. The inventory also tells you all the little bits of information that you ever wanted to know. Um, there's a tab called Management. I'm gonna show you a slide later that'll explain this a little bit better. Um, logs and Settings. So the inventory is where you can just go in and there will, there will be a, a demo about this later on, where you can say, I want to find Macs that are all PowerBooks from 2012 and all run 1075. And location is something that you actually manually fill in. Um, you can tie this system into GSX if you are an Apple Care provider. So if you can look up all the Apple Care details, um, it'll let you learn about all the applications. And it's just infinite amount of information, not infinite, obviously, but. Um, that inventory collects, and that's actually customizable. You can say, I don't really care about the apps, what apps they're running, and you can stop not collecting that app. The um, most important part about JSS is this thing called extension attributes. So the inventory collects you know, a set number of things, and then there's always that one thing it doesn't collect. Um, good examples are if you wanted to know exactly what version of Java people are running. And in JSS, they, it's not really an app, it's a framework. So it's not gonna know to go through slash applications and find a Java version, it's not gonna find it that way. You can write custom scripts to make an extension attribute and that it'll run that script when it does its, you know, what it's called, its inventory or recon and send it back up to the server with the result. So, yes? It's an automated process um, based on how often you want your computers to talk back to the JSS server. So um, by default, it's every 15 minutes in most environments. As your environments get larger and larger, you may wanna spread that out a little bit farther. So where I work right now, it's 2,500 max across like 20 countries around the world, and they all talk back to our Boston JSS. Um, and we space them out every 30 minutes. If we tried every 15, it would just collect way too much information way too quickly. So um, I know it's a little blurry. I don't know if you guys can see, but this is basically when you're in JSS and you're logged in, this is the things that you can do with your, uh, with your computer. So let me talk about the actual management portion. Oh, by the way, this will be mostly focused on the OS X side. There is an iOS side, obviously. Um, I won't be covering that as much, only because it, there isn't really that much you can do with iOS. It's just you're restricted by Apple. MDMs from Casper to AirWatch to Mobile Iron, they all on some level do basically the same thing, just slightly differently. So, But let's talk about um, the management portion of it, especially the OS X side. So in JSS, you can do things like manage preferences, you know, MCX, just like everyone does in Work with Manager. You can do configuration profiles, just like uh, Profile Manager in OS 10.7, 10.8. It mimics those features exactly. Um, it makes some enhancements to those features, but it, you can use that framework. Um, there's a restricted software portion where you can type in the name of a software and if someone's running that software, it'll just say, no, 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 you're a bad boy. You can't run this piece of software. Um, really, really effective at schools that like, you can like double click saying anything with the word torrent in it or transmission.app, if you double click it, it won't let you run it. Um, Pre-stage imaging is about if you have a lot of computers that you need to image really quickly and you want them to just turn on an image instead of like having to click through the image options, that's where you set those options. Um, the main thing I really want to go over is this thing called policies. Uh, policies is Jamf's way of doing a lot of different things. Um, there is some computer enrollment stuff that you can do in JSS as well. Um, someone was asking earlier about disk encryption. Um, JSS can escrow your file vault two keys, and this is where you set that up, set up that information. Um, 
Um, also, you can set up groups, groups of computers, based on what we saw earlier in inventory. So you can say, I want to set up a group of all MacBooks or everyone who has Adobe installed. So those are some of the things you can do in that management section we looked at earlier. <sighs> Any questions? Am I going fast or slow? Go ahead. Yes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to just give you an overview of kind of like of like what to kind of expect, and then I'll show you that demo of how this all kind of ties in. Thank you, though. Good question. Um, so JSS and policies. Policies is their bread and butter. It's really how you can do anything you want it, with your Macs in terms of management. Right? So a policy is just, it's a set of tasks that can be run in a certain order and you can do a lot of things with it. So you can set this task, whether it be to install something, run a script, and add a printer, add doc items, and you can set them up running at certain times. You can limit it to certain, you know, if you have subnets and VLANs, you can limit to that VLAN to a certain time. Um, this is also where you can set it up for what Jamf calls self-service. This is like your the app that people can have on their own computer and says, I want to install this or I want to run this script without having to actually double click and do things. So this is what the policy screen looks like. So as we said, um, you know, you can set categories. The triggered by is literally, do you want to run at startup, you want to run at shutdown, do you want to run every 30 minutes when it checks in? Like I said, scope is where you can limit the scope because sometimes you don't want all your computers to install the exact same thing. Um, packages is packages, like it sounds like. And scripts are scripts. Um, we're going to go into this a little bit deeper. You can add doc items. You can add and remove accounts, change passwords on local accounts. You can, yes, I, I will go into them escaping me right now because I haven't done it in a while, but I think you can also set, you know, firmware passwords in this section as well. Um, you can reboot computers, um, and there's an advanced menu that um, I'm going to go into a little bit. So with the packages portion, which is probably what most people want to do with policies, I want to throw out Office onto these machines. So you can install it. You can cache it. So it just copies the package onto the computer, but doesn't install it. It's useful for people who are going to come in and out of the network every so often. Um, so there is options for uninstalling. Um, Casper actually has a thing that's called fill user template and fill existing user. That's taking that user, it's taking user settings that you personalize in a package and applying it to the template so all users in the future or all existing users and rewriting that. Really dangerous if you don't know, if you're really careful with that because that's an easy way to delete someone's uh, Outlook database. <laughs> it's an easy way to delete someone's Firefox bookmarks. So. Um, there's also a little checkbox that says, you know, set an Apple software update server, um, run the Apple software update server. Scripts. You can run shell scripts. You can run Perl scripts. You can run anything that's interpreted by OS 10. The only options you have for scripts, though, is run before the policy starts or run after everything, everything is done in that said policy. Policies also add printers, remove printers, set default printers, add to the doc, you know, add to the beginning, to the end, remove a doc item. You can do with accounts, like I said, create and delete accounts, reset passwords, directory binding. So you can set up your AD accounts, I mean, I'm sorry, you can set up Casper to have your AD binding credentials and all that information and then push it out to the computer and say, you know, I want this com these computers bound. You know, press the button and there it goes. The management account is the account that the computer has that's able to talk back to Casper. It's this SSH account. It could be hidden. It could be just your local admin account. That's usually what most people do. But uh, if you want to change that password for some reason, there was a security breach. All of a sudden, everyone knows your local admin password. This is a really easy way to change, up, change that password away. Like I said earlier, you can set your EFI password, so no single user mode, no CD booting, you know, for security purposes. 
So the reboot options are, you can say, five minutes. I'm going to pop up this message saying your computer needs to reboot in five minutes. Once they hit OK, that's when that timer starts. If they never hit OK, that timer actually never starts counting down. So if you want to say five minutes, or two minutes, or one minute, you, it displays that message about a reboot. There's also an option in the policy for reboot to not reboot the computer, but just to display the message. And, and these, are, these are, if you're starting to see things, um, that seems a really weird place for me to put that, you know, but that's where it is. You can also reboot if the computer is going to be netbooted the next time around, automatically just netboot the computer as well. Yes? If they press OK, it's going to run the shutdown command locally on the computer. You know, shutdown dash R. You know, if within then that's six. You know, five minutes is six hundred. So that's that's when the minute they hit that OK button, that's exactly what happens. Um, so use with caution is like what I like to say that option. It will never reboot then. That's right. It'll all oh, that message will stay up. And until some action is taken, it, that, act, that next action isn't taken. So the last part of policies is this advanced option. They do a bunch of things that you can do here that I, I think of advanced as more like miscellaneous. Miscellaneous because you weren't sure where, where to put this other stuff. Um, a lot of them are like great little fixes. Like you just want the computers to just run fix permissions, repair permissions. You can do that from here. Um, so, MCX, everyone familiar with MCX, more or less? Um, so Casper's way of doing MCX is they just, you know, it's just managed preferences. Okay, so uh, um, back a step. MCX is the framework that you can use to set preferences for your Macs. So preferences are things like your date and time server, the position of your dock. Um, it can be expanded into other third-party applications. So for Office, we have Preferences managing the names are automatically filled in the Word thing, and the splash screen is ne never comes up. It's, and we have one that actually saves it as .doc instead of .docx. We should probably remove that because everyone uses .docx now. So, um, so you can create it from a template. Uh, a template is they have built-in templates where they already took the work and says, oh, I want to set my energy saver to five minutes. Hit, and you literally just hit energy saver five minutes, and it just creates that plist for you and it just uploads it by itself. Um, if you have a plist that you already use in your from other places, you can just upload that plist and it'll just implement it that way. Um, so any questions about MCX and manage preferences? Okay. Um, same idea with configuration profiles. Um, anyone who's used Apple configurator or IPCU, um, this should look pretty familiar. This is exactly the same technology that you can use for your iOS, you can use for your Macs as well. So profiles are things that literally, you know, control things like, you know, passcodes, you know, your VPN setup, software update, um, directory bindings. Yes? This is exactly like Profile Manager. So this is their plugin for Profile Manager. Um, the nice part about this part is that they have a button that says scope, so you can scope different profiles to different computers. Um, so this is what their log screen looks like, you know, logs are logs. This is a good way to go look into, especially where it says uh, policy logs, say did this policy run successfully, when did it run, how often did it run, if it's one that runs all the time, and if there's failures, they'll show up in there. Per computer. Per computer. Right. So the last part of this is settings. Um, so in the uh, management framework session uh, settings, I'm sorry, there is uh, Casper Admin. This is their web version of an app that's actually called Casper Admin. But you can do some light administration of your packages in this, in this sort of thing. Um, servers is where you set up distribution points. Um, so distribution points is where Casper keeps its repository of packages, images, scripts, all the things that Casper needs that push the files out are stored in what they call a distribution point. Um, you can have more than one distribution point. 
we have 22 distribution points, but one central server. The distribution points are simple AFP file servers. That's all they're doing. Um, the same servers actually also happen to do software update and netboot, which also can be configured here. You just need to tell JSS the IP address, some of the share information, and you're good to go. Um, so we'll go a little bit more over this in the live demo. So, yes. Sure. So it's a couple of options. If you if you have a Mac Mini server, you can go that route. Um, if you install JSS on a Linux server, it'll actually install Netatalk, so you can use that as your AFP share. Um, on Windows, I don't think it does that. You might just use Samba. And worst comes to worst, like I said, if you don't want to do anything with AFP, you can just use HTTP to download all your files. So it'll just serve it through Apache, essentially. Good? Maybe the, I think the demo is going to help. Yeah. So. That was JSS. That's like the heart, the soul, the big server that takes care of everything. Um, in environments, you can have multiple JSSs all around the world. Most people keep you know, one, maybe two, because there's ways to do different things with them. Um, so how do you administer this thing outside of logging into the web app? Yes, sir. Do they cascade onto each other? They are, in the current version, there is no failover built into the system. You can build failovers outside of JSS. So a popular solution is people use a load balancing solution that separate the traffic into two or many servers. The databases are clustered off to different servers. Um, but built into JSS, there's no failover mechanism right now. OK. So Casper admin, right? How do I throw packages up on here? It's basically what it really is. So it's a desktop app. It manages your repository. Your repository, like I said, packages, scripts, and images. So all of them are stored in this central repository. Um, it allows you to add printers. Um, so Casper will be aware of a printer. Casper calls imaging things configurations. It's just their word for image, essentially. A configuration is you know, a base image or no base image sometimes and just a list of packages that you want installed when you're imaging a computer. Um, they have a, a button at the bottom in this app called Clone Distribution Points. I highly recommend no one really use this option for Clone Distribution Points. It's not a very, I, it works most of the times. You can use other ways to have your distribution points in sync. Um, because what the last thing that anyone really wants to do is to have 20 distribution points is to walk in at 8 in the morning and hit clone distribution point, clone distribution point, one at a time. So um, there are other ways to do that. But it's op the option is there. So that's what, that would be your duplication. So yep. Yeah, so. One, one maybe, maybe or that's correct. That's right. Um, there are other ways. Um, the way I do it right now is through rsync. So they have a centralized management point, and I have the all the distribution points, you know, once a day go, hey, what's different here? And then just copy the files back. Composer, is, again, is their um, package utility. Even if you've never bought Casper and anything else, the 100 bucks for Composer is worth every penny. Um, it's a repackaging tool that uses snapshots. So take a snapshot of the computer, make your package, do your thing, take a snapshot again, it'll spit out a PKG of those changes, essentially. It'll do it, yep. It does. Yeah, actually, um, I have, yeah, I've done it on a VM. If you have a VM on a fast SSD, it actually works great. Yep, yep, that's right. Um, it'll actually do it using file eventer, file events. So in other words, even if you didn't want to take a snapshot, you just want to know, just record the event of file changes. This isn't always 100% accurate, but it's 99.9% .9 accurate in my, in my case, so. It'll spit out a PKG, um, the standard Apple PKG. It also spits out something Casper calls a DMG. And Casper calls DMGs packages too, just to confuse everyone. Um, it is not a standard Apple PKG. It is a DMG, and the DMG is just a set of directories and set of files. That's all it is. There's no scripts. 
Um, there's, a, there's a reason why they do it this way, though, and I'll go into it a little bit. With package manifests, these are pre-made lists of files. So if you go to Composer, new, new, and you say, I want to know what other people are using to package Adobe Flash. There is one that says Adobe Flash, and it'll just grab the files on your computer related to Adobe Flash, put them in the right place, and then you hit the button to spit it out as a package, or a DMG. Yes, sorry about that. So file event capture is built in where, have you, anyone here ever used FS Inventor, the app, FS Inventor? So a great app, if you, and it's not being developed anymore, but if you can get a copy of it before it ever disappears from the internet, do so. OS X has a built-in transaction log deep into the system that says anytime the change is made to a file, make a log about it. So it's using that information basically to keep track of what things are changing on your computer for a set time, and then it'll spit out those results. Um, so this is their imaging app. Again, it's an OS X app. It has to run in OS X. It's their runtime, but it runs on anything OS X runs on. So if you want to throw, you want to throw you know, a small OS X image with Casper Imaging as an app on your desktop on a portable hard drive, some people do it that way. The, probably the best, better way to do it is over Netboot, if possible. Um, you know, I, I actually literally, at some time to time, I have like just a computer here. I'll plug in a Thunderbolt cable, Thunderbolt cable, load Casper Imaging on my machine, and have it blast down an image to that computer. So these are the you know, simple things that you expect out of an imaging package, right? Obviously, erase the volume, reboot the computer after you've done. Some people do want that, some people don't want that. For those looking into, I guess, what they call thimaging, um, you probably don't want to check that erase volume option. Um, you know, install these packages, run these scripts, add these printers, set up these accounts. You kind of notice this trend here where it's very specific. Packages, scripts, printers, accounts. Um, the last part is that you can set up the network, you know, if you have static IPs in your environment. So um, really important things like fixed by host files. If you have preferences from different computers from your image and now it's being placed onto a new computer, it'll fix those files properly. Uh, permissions, that show assistant, you know, the setup assistant, if you want that to run, or if you already have accounts pre-created on your image, you probably don't want that to run. Um, remote is there? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. They do not have a built-in tool for you to. Well, yes and no. So they don't. Ha you know, in the same way in Deploy Studio, you can grab an image, right? The way um, Casper wants you to do it is use Composer, and you say, I want a new DMG image, and then you say operating system as one of the options, and it just looks for the operating system disk. Um, if you already have it in DMG format, like in, if you use instant image, you could just throw that straight into Casper admin, which is what I do, actually. Cool. Um, again, remote. Casper remote is their one-off management. I just need to run this package on these five computers, just one off. Um, you can use it as a support tool because there is a screen sharing uh, mechanism. Say, I just want to see your screen share. It does require the other user to actually interact and say, accept your invitation to screen share. It's not a one way, you know, always, you know, always get into that computer. Um, like I said, you can install the packages, add printers, add and remove dock items, create reset accounts. Reboot computer and more because this is, if you notice this chain of like logic, you know, packages, scripts, printers, I, you'll see that exact line over and over and over in the Casper suite. So, Recon, Recon is an OS X, and there is actually a Windows version of this program as well. It is the thing that basically enrolls your computer into. JSS. It basically is a little app that you run that will install the client portion on the computer. It also allows you to create a package that you can distribute whichever way you'd like onto a computer. 
Um, it'll scan your network. If you have a set of credentials that you know that every computer has that credential and every computer has SSH open, you can use that to enroll computers into JSS. And so what Recon really does is it installs this thing called the Jamf binary. It's a little file. It lives in user spin, and it's just called Jamf. I'll show you guys in the demo what that looks like. This, is that, this little Unix executable is actually doing all the work. It's actually running at a certain time. It uh, gets your reports. It looks for new things to run from the server. It runs those things. It'll you know, add directory bindings, remove directory bindings, so on and so forth. So the last thing uh, I just want to point out real quickly, um, Jamf makes this product called NetSus. NetSus is Netboot and Software Update Server. It is a Linux virtual machine. It is not running OS X. Um, like I said, it's a, it runs Netboot and it runs Reposado, which is you know, an open source Apple software update server replacement. The reason they did this is they had a lot of customers coming up to them saying, I can't get my data center to approve me putting a Mac Mini or a Mac Pro. It's not rack, or it's not rack mountable. They won't let me put it in. So they threw this out there. Um, you should probably, you know, they're pretty good about this. Um, there's probably going to be more development in this area as well from Jamf in the future. So why everyone's here? Let's actually go into the actual demo. So. Can everyone see that okay? Okay, perfect. So I am going to start just to log into this demo server I have. It's just running on a VM on my computer. Nothing special. I just set it up yesterday. So like I said, inventory, management, logs, and setting. So inventory is where I can go. I want to find out more about my computers. So I've taken the time to just already enroll my computer. I'll re-enroll it just to show you guys what that looks like. But it'll give me some basic information right here. But if I hit details, this is the good stuff, right? Last known IP address. This is the quote unquote management account. This is just a local account from my company that we just used to enroll computers with. Last time it reported, last contact date. So the report is that it doesn't always run inventory. You know, it runs inventory whenever you set it to. Sometimes you only want it once a week. Sometimes you want it once a day. Um, the last contact is last time it made any sort of contact back to the server. So, you know, good info, like user ID, you know, number of processors, the build, um, the operating system. Yeah, I'm testing 10.8.4. Um, um, so no extension attributes. It'll tell me if they have other hard drives built into the computer as well. Um, nice part here, it'll tell me my file vault 2 status, um, you know, and what state, what status it's in as well. Uh, let's see, the applications list, and it's literally going with anything that has a .app. Um, there is an option to look for Unix executables that makes this very large very quickly, and it's one of those things that they tell you not to check off, but they still give you that option. Um, so there's that. These are things for packages and receipts. So these will tell you what's been installed by Casper and what has not been installed by Casper. Users, printers, you guys get the general idea. Yes. Yes. So barcode one and two is something that you can manually edit in here and enter into your JSS. You can use this in Recon as well. So they, my systems right now don't use it, but if you did barcode computers, and this was something that was set up with a USB barcode scanner, you can probably boop, have it in and then hit save. Exactly. Yeah, the, all this information can be changed depending on your level of, you know, if you log in as what user into this interface. So they have, you can delegate rights. You know, I have people that can only run inventory but can't write policies, that kind of thing. Yes. So this is protecting all the Macs on your network, but regardless of whether they have the Jamf binary. It is detecting Macs on your network that have the Jamf binary. Okay. If they do not, they are not considered enrolled, and thus they're not going to get that information. So the Jamf binary you can install locally, or else you can Apple make a Yep. It's so 
by on imaging, it is installed by default. If it's not by imaging, um, you can use the recon tool to try to remotely install it. Um, or you can just hand out a package to people and distribute it, which other method that you currently have in right now. Yes. Uh, yep. That's right. It'll determine, it basically, it'll look for, it'll look for, um, you can type in a username and a set of SSH pa possible passwords. It'll go to every machine, try to log in SSH, try that password, and if it doesn't get in, then it won't be able to enroll it. So, um, before I go into policies, I just want to show you real quickly with manage preferences and create a preference, and from template, this saves a lot of time because then you can be, you can say, um, you know, iTunes, disable podcasts, or if you have, you know, in a K through 12 and you don't want to just disable, you can disable the iTunes music store altogether. So, um, and it does, like I said, third party. So Microsoft updates, you know, how to check automatic versus manual. So if you don't want your users updating Office by themselves, you can do that here. And the same thing applies for configuration profiles. This is not going to work. Well, that's all right. Um, so this looks very familiar if you've ever used I, um, Apple Configurator. Um, it's the same ideas. You know, you can configure software update servers. You could have done that in MCX as well. Um, my recommendation would be to use profiles if possible. There are still some things that you have to, for some reason, just does it work quite right in profiles and you have to use MCX for? You know, eventually I'm sure there will be some level of parity. You can use both at the same time. Um, someone was asking about encryption. So disk encryption, this is where I can say recovery key is individual. Institutional is your master. If you want to go this route, your master encryption key that you push out to all the computers. Um, it works for some people. For me, it's a single point of failure that now everyone has your, if someone does break into it, now everyone has it. And then you have to like rush to get a new one out there. Um, right now, a, a lot of people we use is individual. And what happens is it saves your escrow key if they use the Casper built-in tools to encrypt, your, to encrypt or start File Vault 2. So, Policies. Policies is this thing where you are able to do all these things. So I'm going to create one manually. They give you some preset options. Um, I like always using the manual process because you have access to everything. So your policy can be triggered by you know, any means, anytime it checks in, essentially, or anything it does, anytime it sneezes, it basically will run this policy. Um, every 15 is you know, that every 15 check-in time. You can have things run at startup, log in and log out. Um, so you can have packages. You can add a package. I just happen to have you know, Java in here. Like I said, you can install it, cache it. Um, there's an option that you can say install all cache packages. So that would be a second policy after your first policy. Your first policy says cache these things. Your second policy will say at a later time to set to be run, now install all these cache packages. Um, you know, you can add printers. Um, so with printers, it adds the, it's basically the PPD file that it's grabbing. Um, and it's grabbing it from Casper Admin when you added it to Casper. And it pushes out that PPD file. It does not push out the driver. So in any time you want to install a printer in a Casper policy, you have to use packages and install the printer driver as well, unless you're sure that the printer driver already exists, the exact printer driver that you use to upload the printer with, with that exact PPD. So, um, so you can add a printer. I don't have, we'll, we'll look into that a little bit. You can remove printers from computers as well. Um, yes? So, that's a trick question. <laughs> the trigger in most cases will be every 15 if you're pushing out a piece of software. If it's something like Microsoft Office where nothing from Office can run while, you're, while the package is being pushed out, 
you have to get a little creative um, with, with policies and how this works. And that's a positive and a negative. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna try to demonstrate that and see how that works. So everyone kind of get a general idea of like what policies look like though. Basically, policies is the heart of Casper. You can do everything through a policy. If you really wanted to, you know, like I said, you can do those managed preferences. You really, if you really wanted to just use a policy instead and say, and to enforce it, it'll every 15 minutes, if you change that, I'm just gonna change it right back. You can do that. So let me start the process here. So when you install Casper, these are the apps we were talking about earlier. Um, I forgot to talk about recon.exe. So it's a Windows app. It doesn't manage Windows. Just in case for some crazy reason that your institution is 99% max, but there's two Windows machines, and you want to just have an inventory of them in JSS, it's there. I've never seen any environment actually use it, but I'm sure it's there for a reason. So here's recon. So my computer's already enrolled, but I can, like I said, you know, if I have the IP address and a username and password, I can do that. I can scan IP addresses. So if I wanted to scan the whole PSU Wi-Fi network, they'd probably really love me for doing that and add computers to Casper. If I knew their um, passwords, I can do that. This quick add is the one that'll create the PKG that if you don't have, if you have an older way of distributing it and you want to enroll computers, you can do it that way. Um, I've heard of people that actually just take this recon thing, put it on a USB stick, plug into a computer, double click on it, and they so local inventory. Here I am. I can now I can enter the barcode here if you want to do asset tracking, and I can hit submit. Recon's going to open an SSH session into Casper. It's going to start looking for things. It's going to start doing an inventory. So. So while that's running, actually, you know what? Where did it go? Here it is. So my computer is now in, in Casper. Before I go into something else, let's say I wanted to create, I don't know what my password is anymore, um, a package. So in an IOU world, all our vendors would have Apple standard PKGs that would never ever need to be repackaged and they all one work wonderfully and there's no hesitation about stuff like that. So in the real world, um, you can create what they call pre-installed environments. So these are things that people were nice enough to think about and saying, these are the files you need to install program X. So uh, I'm gonna use Firefox as an example. So what it's doing is actually searching my computer finding files that some, you know, the community, the Jamf community, these aren't created by Jamf, these are created by community users, said, I need to, you know, get Firefox installed. So the files are located in, you know, slash applications, which is obvious. And that seems pretty obvious too, you know. So users, this is where things get really interesting. If I took this package and built a PKG, and then I sent it to someone, they would get Firefox at app, and they would get this, and then all of a sudden, on their computer, they would have a folder called My Name Library Application Support, which does them no good. This is where this Build as DMG option comes in. Build as DMG is, like I said, it's going to grab those files and throw it just into a plain old DMG file. What Casper can do with that file is that it can fill in that user existing and fill in that, um, I'm sorry, fill in existing user or fill in, fill user template. So they call it Futt and Foo. Um, oh, stop, 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 semantic. And we keep going. So what I'm eventually going to want to do is that I want JSS to know about this newly created Firefox thing. That's wonderful. Like I said, I never changed my name, by the way, in that package. I just, it, my name is still in there, technically. No, oh, you're JSS. Okay. 
So this is that admin console I was talking about earlier. So like I said, this is where you can keep things. Configurations are where you can have you know, your, your pre-built thing, uh, which should always be a priority one. So this is where you set priorities of when things should run. Um, but this is set for imaging. It's also set for policies. It's also the same priority for anything that Casper does, which can be good and can be bad because now you can't separate separately set priorities for different things. But you're given a choice for 1 through 20. Hopefully, you can fit your workflow into that kind of logic. And these are the small little things. I'm like, well, what if I just want the priority to be in imaging only but not in when I do a policy, and they're like, that doesn't work. You pick one, you do both, or you figure or you have two policies that do the exact same thing, which to me seems silly, but that's just the way it is. So I can say with imaging, I want these two things in my imaging configuration. So when I load Casper Imaging, it'll install my instant image and then install Java. I also want it to now have Firefox. So I've uploaded Firefox now to my repository. Um, I'm going to throw Firefox in there as well. Now, remember, I said Firefox still has my user profile with all my bookmarks, which let's assume that I want to push that out to everyone. Let me uh, jump back into JSS again. So management, policies. And now let's just create a policy that says everyone should always get Firefox. And that it's every 15 minutes, whenever the computer checks in, and I want it to just be once per computer because I don't want it to always run ongoing. Um, there's some policies that you probably just want once per user logging in. More popular is something that you want on a regular basis to run, a script to change their firewall settings or to maintain things. You can do that daily, weekly, monthly. But I'm going to do this you know, once per computer. I'm going to say all assigned computers. Now, if I wanted to, I could have created a smart group. So I can say, oh, I want to create a group that says, I don't have Firefox. So under software information, application title, application title has or does not have you know, Firefox. As you can see, Firefox, edit criteria, am I in here? Why am I in here? I don't think I had Firefox installed. No, I do have Firefox installed. Oh, that's why. So as you can see, Firefox zero. I'm going to I'm going to show you the Jamf binary very quickly. Can you guys see that, by the way, or do I? Uh, let me just make that a little bit bigger. And I don't know an I terms. Can you make the text bigger? Yes. So this, this is the things that the Jamf binary can do. It can check your JSS connection. When I run JSS, um, what am I looking for? Recon. That's when it actually submits an inventory. When I hit manage, it actually runs policies. So I am actually going to do Jamf. Uh, recon. So it's actually doing all the background information as we saw earlier, locating the hardware, locating Unix apps, and it's just doing its little merry little thing. So, like I said, and now it comes up with zero. Zero computers does not have Firefox. Uh, let's make this a little bit bigger. So let's do this again. Create a policy it's for Firefox that you know, runs on every 15, let's just say. And let's say it does not have Firefox. Add computer to group. Right? So I want them to get Firefox. Add package. So this is where that magic foot and foo action happens. So I can say, fill user template. Firefox will take what was my name, rename that to, you know, slash system slash library slash user template slash blah, blah, blah. 
With this, it'll actually take whatever whatever existing users and users slash whatever and throw app that those application support Firefox files right into there. Well, Can't, their it will overwrite their bookmarks. So that is one of those things. If you want to do this option, fill existing user, you use this very carefully. With printers, how do you add a printer? Well, in Casper Admin, I hit Add Printer. I'm having a hard time remembering everyone's password right now. So these are printers that I have from my workplace. And that's how you add a printer. The printer actually has to be installed on the computer that you're using Casper Admin from. There's no real other way. If you can just do like LPD colon slash slash, here's my IP address. It's not the way it works. So, so that gets uploaded. Yes? Yes, so if, as long as the print queue is set up in the you know, in system preferences, printers, whatever's in there is what you can add. So it's, it, it essentially is just literally looking in this list. You know, whatever's in here is whatever can be added to Casper Admin. The caveat is, for me, now I have, I have to add some printer in India that I have no idea about onto my computer simply to add it to Casper Admin. It, again, one of those weird little things. So let's go back to our policy. Sorry about jumping around. Um, if I wanted to add a doc item, if I had doc items already added, again, with Casper Admin, add doc items, but it's the doc items of my computer, again. So, so in other words, if someone has some really weird app that they want the doc always to be there, I have to kind of get that doc item on my computer to be able to upload it, even if I'm never using it. Um, Casper Admin, I'm sorry? You could if it's if it's possible. Um, some people it's not possible for though. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. Once it's uploaded, it's in, it's in there. Yeah. See, so like this is a printer that's been added there that I added recently. If I remove this from this computer, it doesn't matter. It's just again taking taking a snapshot of what's on your computer and then uploading it. Um, this little dot here means changes not changes made but not saved. Always save, always save in Casper Admin. There's a lot of things, you can make a ton of changes and then you hit quit. And usually it's good about asking you about would you like to save these changes, but that one time it doesn't and then all of a sudden you go back to Casper Admin and none of your changes are made, so. So with the reboot option, um, this is where I said earlier, display message if not rebooting, kind of handy, you know. So don't reboot the computer for God's sakes. Really don't bleep your computer. Um, but I wanted to say, wow, I should say, are you having fun yet? That's like crazy dyslexia there. So um, accounts, again, this is where you can create, reset, and delete accounts. This update inventory button in advanced. So you can run this policy, and it's, and it's set to run on computers that don't have Firefox installed. Now, the policy runs, but until recon runs again, it'll still stay in that group and potentially keep running that policy. So anytime you use a scope of a smart group, you probably want it to update the inventory so it goes into a different smart group, into a new smart group, or gets out of this smart group. So smart groups are your friend, basically, in, um, in, this, uh, in this environment. So if you want to target you know, people with exactly a certain file vault two status, you know, no, you know, part, no partitions encrypted, you can target this group and then make them do certain things at every 15 or when they log in or when they log out. All righty. So I'm gonna quit out of Composer. I'm gonna minimize this for a second. Where's my, oh, wrong one. So, Casper Remote. Casper Remote is something that you can, you know, remote into. I only have one computer in here, but you can have all your computers listed here. 
Um, what gets a little crazy is when you have 2,000 computers listed here, and you have to filter it this way, or you can scroll. So this should look familiar if you just saw those policies. Packages, scripts, printers, docs, account, reboot. It's basically running a policy one-off, essentially. Here's the thing. Packages, it's, nothing's really showing up here because, did I save? At least Firefox is showing up here. I'm not sure why it's not showing up here. The packages can't be just some DMG or some PKG you just happen to have on your computer. It has to be in the Casper repository. Because what's, ha what's happening is that when you hit go, it's not doing a direct connection. You're basically just tunneling in via SSH saying and typing out Jamf, go check into your local distribution point to get these things. So in some ways, it's not like, you know, sometimes you're just like, I just need to install this one thing. You know, I just create it really quickly. You have to upload it to the, at, to the repository. And if it's in a distribution point that they, they need access to, you need to replicate that to that distribution point halfway around the world before you can actually then use Casper Remote. So small scales, it's fine. You upload it, save it, it seems fine. But um, it gets a little complicated when things happen on a larger scale. Does anyone have any questions about that kind of quick demo I just gave? Yes. So that only depends if you are able to use your JSS on the internet, because it has to be able to talk back to the JSS. So Jamf gives you some options that you can sort of securely put that database, that front end on the internet. Um, a lot of companies do it that you, so you can do some level of managers. You will get it'll report back the IP from their ISP wherever they are. So, but um, so there's some level of management possible there. You can also push out you know policies and packages and everything else. The problem is then now you're considering your band upload bandwidth if you're trying to push Office or Adobe CS6 to your home user. So just things to keep in mind, I guess, in that sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, we use MomGuard for remote support at where I work right now. I love it. Um, I use ARD to manage things that I don't want to manage in Casper, like the actual distribution points, because I don't want to accidentally create a package that'll install some large package on my servers. So it's something that I just, it's just out of habit, just don't like to do. Um, so you can do that. The Casper remote thing really is meant to be a one-off policy. You don't want to save this policy for future use ever and ever and ever. You just want it to run a couple of times or for testing purposes. Does this policy work before I push it out to everyone? And what was the second question? Mm -hmm. It actually it actually passes both. It passes both both MAC addresses when it does recon up to up. It'll show up as one. It'll show up as EN one and EN zero essentially. Um, so, yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. Some other way. Yes. So GSS does have, um, if, you do, if you enable the option, slash enroll gives you an option for them to, if you want to hook it into AD, log in with your AD credentials so you're not just letting anyone just download the package. And then it downloads the, the quick add package for them, and then you just double click and run it. This is something that you know, some people want to do, and some people said, I don't want people to self-enroll. So it's up, to, it's up to your environment in that level. All right. Yes, if you tie, you can tie it into Open Directory, Active Directory, just anything LDAP based. You can tie JSS into. So, I gave you like I just gave you the ten thousand foot overview. Um, 
So it works. It works for you know, 3,000 organizations and up. It works very well. It's, you know, they're up version eight and they're releasing version nine. You know, pretty soon, again, the stuff that we talked about, policies, managed preferences, that's not going away in version nine. They just look slightly different in the web app, basically. Um, there's a lot of new features that a lot of people have been kind of mad about. So like when we talk about smart groups, I can't do a smart group within a smart group, which would be really nice. I have to create different smart groups and then I have to think about the logic. Oh, this smart group will move this computer into this smart group, and then I need to run this in this smart group. So the logic, 2011 is a good example of that. So I need to make sure that the computer is not running. I have to make a smart group of people saying, do you have this version of Office? Yes. Now next, do you need to, you need to basically run this, but you can't have Office open. And then I, so I need to like always bug these people, please close office before it installs. And that's that push button for like displaying. But it's, it's, I have to create like four or five different policies just to do that one package essentially. So there is, and they're fixing that in later versions. So nested smart groups are one of those things that are coming up. Best of breed is something that there are always, you're going to hear from them a lot. That's a term they use saying, we'll always focus just on the Apple platform, no other platforms. So if you want a central console for your PCs and Macs, this isn't going to be it. Um, if you want something that's really, really, really focused on just your Mac platform, and it happens to talk to SCCM, and it happens to talk to Altiris, and it happens to you know, do all these other things, but their focus is just Apple. Um, they have a community website called Jamf Nation. It's incredibly useful. Um, what's even more useful, though, is that just calling Jamf support, it's very easy to get someone um, email on the phone. They're relatively responsive. Um, they offer uh, professional services as well. If you really have a very complicated situation, you need them to create custom scripts, you can pay them for that. So here's the dun dun dun. <laughs> it's not free. It's definitely not free. And anyone who's ever priced this out knows that very clearly. That if, and as, uh, everyone here basically in education, essentially, more, uh, not, not in education, so it's the, the retail pr the price of Jamf outside of education is three times that. So it's not it's a pretty penny to pay for Apple management and something that you know a lot of things can be replicated with other tools. Um, like I said, it's the Jamf way or the highway. That weird logic things we were talking about with the smart groups sometimes drives me crazy, but it works. Yes. The quick, the, the um, jump starts, that's right. You may want to talk to your, your rep and seeing if that is required for EDU or not, though. It is, okay. Sometimes they, they, they change their mind on it every so often. They're like, it is, and then it isn't, then it is, and it isn't. It's definitely required if you're, if you're not EDU. They sometimes waive it for, for EDUs, but um, again, talk to your rep. It's, it's basically, it's, it's a hands-on session of, what I just tried to do in about 30 minutes, they do for three days. So um, on site with you and your packages and your images and everything else. So basically, you're, you're up and running and ready to go from day one after that. Um, my uh, favorite little analogy about that, it's the jam way or the highway. And once you have a hammer, right, everything looks like a nail. So the proper way to do things is probably through MCX. but if you didn't want to do that, you wanted to just throw everything in a policy, and I've seen some places that everything is just in a policy, you know, policy this, policy that, policy that. It works, but is it really the right way to do things? And that depends, again, on your, on your thing. Um, I know for us, at 2,500 computers, we had to start looking at two servers load balanced with 32 gigs of RAM, and, um, and they're Mac Pros. They're like they're 2010 Mac Pros, so they're you know, beefy, beefy CPU. Um, it wasn't really CPU, it was RAM. It loves RAM. Tomcat loves the RAM. More RAM you can throw at Tomcat, the better. So let's talk about some alternatives. Well, <sighs> yes, I I'm... I'm not gonna, I, I can't answer that because it's just hard to, you know, everyone's situation is gonna be different. Um, you know, if you have 20 now, are you gonna have 100 later? You know, in, in two years, it's hard to say because 
and but even even with twenty, it, it might be nice to know you have all these things in one console that you can have your profile set up instead of having OSN server and profile manager and then having work group manager do MCX. And then outside of that, you know, then you have to set up Monkey, Deploy Studio. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing to have everything in one console versus these separate ideas. So Deploy Studio, everyone, I'm sure a lot of people use Deploy Studio. I love Deploy Studio. Um, I think, I'm not gonna say it's a better product than the, the Casper Imaging product, but it's definitely more flexible. So. Casper Imaging is install these things in the priorities you set in Casper Admin, and then there's a reboot and install these things, but that's it. There's only one reboot possible. You can't say in Deploy Studio, package, script, package, package, the script, the script, reboot, do AD, reboot again. It's, it's, there's more flexibility in Deploy Studio if you need it, but we use Casper Imaging and it works, it works just fine, but some people just want that a little more flexibility. So more, like I, I call it more uh, robust workflows. And someone mentioned Netboot. For Casper Imaging to work over Netboot, you kind of have to manually create a Netboot set yourself. So it's a base image, and you just happen to throw Casper Imaging, and then you upload that. Deploy Studio is nice, where I can just hit that button, create Netboot set, and just walk away, and 30 minutes later, it spits something out, and I can just upload it. I mean, it's a small thing, but it's, you know, it's there. So Monkey is open source. Um, as we talked about you know, server requirements, that repository, um, you can just, it's just any web server, to be honest. It, so, um, and a lot of people like using Monkey for their people because it looks like the old software update that pe some people are still used to. Um, so it's familiar in that sense. Um, client side logic, that's where I like to go. You know, so Casper is a push. The server pushes things to clients, right? With Monkey and, and in a lot of ways Puppet, clients, look at it and say, hey, I, you know, what do I have on this computer? Oh, let me check against this web server, right, what I'm supposed to have based on these manifests in Monkey. So it's pulling information down. Now these are small philosophical differences, but you know, there are a lot, there are proponents of one versus the other. Um, again, Puppet's a uh, open source platform. It's cross-platform too, it does Windows machines, and it's meant for servers, but you can manage OS X very well. And the nice thing about Puppet is that they call it declarative. So it's one of those things where you can say, I want my machines to look like this. They must have Office, they must have these settings, and they must have these users installed. If any of those things change, Puppet is just gonna go back in and say, hey, this changed, I'm gonna set it back the way it used to be. Um, so that infrastructure as code idea, code is repeatable. You, you wrote it once, it's gonna repeat the same way over and over again. Um, when you start introducing your human hands and typing fingers and mouse movements, you know, things get a little, things can get a little interesting. So, it can be the answer to everything because it has, you know, it's a central console, does imaging, does, you know, policies and security procedures, does your MCX, does your, um, it does, it really does everything from start to finish, inventory. Um, you don't have to pick sides either. So. A lot of people that I know love how Monkey installs things over um, how Casper installs things. Because Casper is kind of like a brute force, like I'm gonna make you install this thing. But Monkey has a little bit more logic about, oh, you, dependencies and things need to be installed before this gets installed, and you can set that logic in. Um, there are lots of Casper admins that run Monkey on the side for certain things and Casper for other things. So um, these are just two quick software, I'm sorry, <laughs> URLs, um, that's Jamf's website. The Jamf Nation website is fantastic. It's just a great way to just ask any question you want um, and have just other people who use the software every day just answer them. Um, so we're almost out of time, but it's the last conference and I'm always happy to answer anyone's questions about Jamf. The reps are out there. Um, you can ask them any questions obviously as well. But so questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, was it was it my decision to begin with? <laughs> so, um, so you know, I've, I've I've had positions where I was using Monkey in, in Deploy Studio because the, the, the they was declared that I must use as little funds as possible in my previous jobs to make what this to work. It was, a, it was a lot of ramp up and a lot of work to get it started, but it works now. Um, 
you know, I went to a new job. They happened to rerun in Casper. They happened to just, you know, happily send me to get training on it. And, 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 and in a lot of ways, it makes my life a lot easier using it. Once you learn how it thinks, once you learn its own little internal logic about how smart groups work, how, what it looks for in a smart group, and how you can take a computer and put them into different smart groups and logically apply different policies that way, you're kind of forced to think its way and not verse vice versa. With Monkey, it's a little bit more vice versa, where I want Monkey just to install Office, and it kind of figures itself out automatically, where you kind of have to be, um, I guess procedural is, is a good way to put um, Casper in policies. You have to be like step A, step B, step C, step D kind of thing, and it follows those procedures um, like a computer should, but you're the one thinking about that logic, not you know, necessarily Casper in a lot of ways. Like I said, when everything is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Other questions? Yes? So it is, it's, you know, I don't use it. Um, I've only seen this brief demo of it, and I can't talk to everything about it. The way I, I, I think it works is that it'll grab data from SCCM. If you have things managed in SCCM, put them into JSS, and then you can use JSS. So if, you, if your Macs are already enrolled in SCCM, but the SCCM client doesn't do what you want it to do, it can export stuff back into the SCCM database. Um, so the last time I checked SCCM, it doesn't even work with Mountain Lion. So SCCM, you know, you can, if some places are big SCCM shops and everything has to be in that database, and that's great, now you can just tell JSS, hey, let's just grab, these, grab this information so you have instant recon information, and then let's now run the policies that way on computers that are supported. Yes? I do not, and that is something to talk to the reps outside with. I try, I try to stay away from that stuff as much as I can. <laughs> yes. Yes. Focus is an iOS product from Casper and is just released like last week. And it's, so I never really spoke to the uh, MDM side of Casper. So Casper does MDMs. Um, like every other MDM though, you're limited to how much you can do with your iOS devices because Apple says you can do this, but you can't do that. You can't screen share your iOS devices or remote share, that kind of thing. What Casper's done is using that you know, restrictive framework, um, Casper Focus is, the ability of pushing some of the more complicated MDM stuff to the teacher in a classroom. So the teacher now has a list of iPads that are their iPads in that room only. And Focus can say, I want these iPads to only have this app open, but it's an iPad that the teacher has. So it's pushing a lot of that management down to the teacher level to make it easier on a per class basis. So I, I, you know, I've only seen demos of it. It's really nice for what it is, but it's, and it's definitely a dedicated education product. Um, not so much just the general, it's part of the 8-7 suite, that's correct.